Welcome back, everybody, to Two Guys in a Stack of Comics. My name is Reed. Along with me, as always, is Mike. Mike, we're going to dive into a topic today that you and I has bugged us for years. We, we've kind of danced around it and talked about it a little bit in different videos, but we wanted to come at it from a different angle today. And that is the impact of comic book movies on the actual comic book market itself. Uh, mainly, we're going to focus on the big two. I know there's been a lot of indie movies that have developed, TV shows that have developed. And that, that plays a role in it as well. But overall, we just wanted to talk about what was the overall impact of the comic book movie kind of boom that we saw. It's slowing down now, but it's still going a bit on the actual comic book industry. So for you, Mike, on this, I know comic book movies about 20 years have been sort of what since really since the Spider-Man in 2002 was that huge blockbuster one. You had a couple like X-Men and obviously, you know, Superman in the 70s and Batman in the 80s. But really from about 2002 to really 2022, probably. We kind of had box office dominance. Do you think comic book movies overall, even though they should have helped, ended up having a negative impact on comic books themselves? I think I think it's a net zero. Okay. Um, in some ways, but I think it remains to be seen uh, as comic book movies decline, what happens to the sales? Um I don't know the numbers, but I just have a feeling that it didn't help comic books all that much. It raised the brand of the heroes. Um, they made a lot of money, the movies did. Um, the comic book companies themselves made some money off of merchandising, from what I understand. So that could be a plus. But as far as your regular Wednesday warrior paper in hand, I'm reading a comic. I don't know that it had all that much impact, maybe on a couple of characters like Batman and Spider-Man. But by and large, like we've said over many videos, when your kids are pumped after a superhero movie and you go to the comic book store after and there's nothing that is in concurrence with whatever they just saw, it's a big missed opportunity and it just <clears throat> so what's on the manga shelf dad okay let's go over and look at the mangas and um that's just you know poor marketing on the the ink and paper part of the business because you, you know that part is declining and you needed a shot in the arm and for 20 years you had good opportunities to give it a shot in the arm and it's over and it's and like, they just never did yeah it's like whatever like you and i were saying in one video wouldn't it have been cool if when there was a spider-man movie out or a hulk movie out or avengers movie out that you printed up you know four million copies of you know a 399 comic book and shipped them out to every movie theater in town, you would have sold every single one of them. And oh, yeah. by the way, there could have been a little coupon in there for a discount at your local comic book store. I mean, there's a million possibilities that could have led to the movie industry supporting the print industry, but they're in two different buildings, you know, two yeah. different creative teams, two different marketing teams. No brainchild. There was no uh, Steve Jobs to kind of like, you know, integrate uh, everything. Yeah, integrate everything. There was no mastermind. They were just all after the the money in their own division of the same industry, and sadly, that's where it's at. So in my mind, it's a net zero. Um, and man, I feel like you know what a missed opportunity. They could have sold 4 million comics movie, you know, release month. You know, he had 21. Yeah, if there had been an Avengers comic book when an Avengers movie came out and you went to like the, the concession stand, you know, if you'd yeah. had like an Iron Man cover, a cap cover, you could have had. Millions yeah. of people had that. Then you could have had the variant issue. If you liked Hulk, there was a Hulk version, a Hulk cover. There was a Thor cover. There was a cap, co you know, you, you could have gone wild. Yeah, it's, it's almost like they never even tried to be honest, yeah, and I don't I ever mean, remember seeing, and we've seen so much with these, you know, you go to these theaters, at least here in San Antonio, where we've gone, these popcorn buckets and these collectible cups and all these things, those things sell yeah. out 
and really the quick. Cardboard pop ups and the posters, even on the Spider Man re release, the 20th anniversary re release that they did in June for all the yeah. old Spidey movies, they had a printed poster out for anybody who wanted one. So we all got these little mini posters for each one. It was really cool. But oh my God, would dad have forked over an extra three to five bucks for a comic? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it was a massive missed opportunity. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a net negative. I th- or net, net zero. I think it was a net negative. I think a lot of things happened. So I think there's three or four things I can point to that I think actually made movies a negative for the comics as unbelievable as that is. Um, I think the only positive, I'll start with the only positive. There were some characters that got comic book series that probably wouldn't have because of the prevalence of movies. I know characters like T'Challa, Doctor Strange, uh, especially a lot of the MCU ones, Ant-Man, didn't have books for years. Guardians of the Galaxy didn't have books for years, and they got comic books normally with pretty good creative teams, um, at least relaunched. And then as, as a result, those books stayed around for a little bit. So I do think there was some positive for that. That's the only real thing that I can think that was a positive. Where I can't even really make that too much of a positive, though, I think a couple of different things happened. I think one, the characters all changed based on their movie county part counterpart, and not for the better. When you when you look at what happened with the MCU, initially the MCU was really, really good at taking characters like Iron Man and Captain America and Thor and kind of refining them down back to formula for an audience, but they were still true to what a comic book fan would expect. Right. Those phase one movies, when you went in to watch the Avengers, Hulk felt like Hulk, Black Widow felt like Black Widow, Iron Man felt like Iron Man, et cetera. Right. And that was cool as a comic book fan because it kind of felt like, hey, we've we've trimmed down all the excess. We put it in this really presentable package. And so for a little bit for the movies, it was kind of cool to see them do that in the comic books as well. What I think ended up happening, though, is you did have some of these more complex characters that didn't get the best on screen representation. And then it carried over into the comic book representation of the character as well. So I know characters like Black Panther, um, well, he got a great on-screen one because the movie had so much prevalence of Shuri and the Dora Milaje. Black Panther's comic book stopped being about T'Challa and started about being all of those other characters that were prevalent in the movie. Characters like Doctor Strange, for the couple years when his first movie came out, he changed from this very wise and kind of sage sorcerer to he was more sarcastic and didn't really fit with who he'd been in the comic books. I know from the DC angle, they would start drawing the characters different to look more. And again, there's part of me that understands the integration of it. But again, like you said, they never fully committed to let's integrate these. They never put a comic that was ingrained in the MCU or the DCEU or anything like that. But then they would want to make these slight changes that just didn't work at all. I think the other parts that happen too that are more negative, and I'd be interested to get your thoughts on, on one of these is, I think secondly, the big issue was creatives stopped creating comic books for the comic book sake and i think a lot of them started making arcs that were designed for movies to get them into the indie space so they could get a tv show adapted or something like that and so i think what you saw happen is you saw instead of a bunch of people coming in to the big two and trying to put these you know plots together and things like that because of the way the movies treated the comic book creatives who were responsible for these stories, I think a lot of the creatives all departed for the indie scene because it was like, you know what? I can go bust my hump for Marvel, put together an amazing story. They can turn it into a $2 billion movie. And all I'm going to get is it's seven minutes into the credits at the very bottom. Special thanks to with that. Cre- I, I, it's, I think that disincentivized so much. And I think we even saw this lately. Um, was it Donnie Cates and Ryan Stegman created the character Null for the Venom comic book. That comic book sold out. That comic book did really well. Venom 3 did a new trailer this week where they revealed that character was in the movie. And the guys who created that character, like, we had no idea that character was in this movie. And so as creatives, I think you started to see guys like that who became so disincentivized because I'm going to bust my butt, do all this great work for Marvel and DC, create this awesome character, this awesome plot, this awesome whatever, and they're going to turn it into a blockbuster movie And I'm not going to see a dime. And I think that started making a lot of the creative talent for the big two, not only with some of the other issues, but I think that alone, they went, you know what? If I'm going to write a great plot, why don't I go write it for image 
instead. And if that turns into a movie, I get the credit. I think that was what stood out to me. What about you? You kind of wonder, like, if back in the 60s, that option were available to Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby and some of them, they definitely would have jumped ship. If they would have had an avenue, you know, a viable avenue like the indies are now, for uh, TV and movie, um, they're just mined constantly for content. And then it gets, you know, put into a Amazon series or whatever, and, and they get, you know, residuals for that. Um, mm-hmm. I, I know Jack would have would have done that. And how cool would that have been? No, you know, they would get credit like, for what they did, yeah. <laughs> you know, have a, you know, an independent comic and a movie with Jack Kirby at the helm, that would have been really cool. So yeah. yeah, I think you know the um, the creators uh, have uh, gotten wise, and you know, uh, I like I've said before, I kind of think that you know rather than the other way around, which is the way it was for eighty years, now you know if you're breaking into the art of comic creation, you're using Marvel and DC as a stepping stone to get and to the you get a ten, you know, you get a little bit of a six or eight part series on spider-man and then you jump over to the indies and start cranking out content and hope it gets picked up by netflix yeah no i I think then you're making the big bucks and you're making you know you're probably making more a little bit more over at the indies and you have a shot at residuals if your idea catches on whereas you get nothing but the paycheck at marvel and dc well, I think what's what started happened there, I think definitely it disincentivized the creatives. I think there was two other ways that it really was negative. Um, you started to see where these studios would come in, and I felt like for the comic book line, they would start benching characters that they didn't have the rights to. When you look at what Marvel did, what was it 2014, 2015? They basically completely killed off the X-Men and the Fantastic Four because it was like, well, we didn't control you. Fox does. So we're going to try to make the Inhumans a big deal, and we're going to really push the Guardians of the Galaxy. And when you look at what they did with these comic books, I mean, they did an Avengers versus X-Men event that really made the X-Men the outright villains of that of that event to prop up the Avengers. They did an Inhumans versus X-Men event, which, again, kind of pitted the X-Men as the villains. They did a lot of stories like that where it was like, well, we don't control the rights to this character. And so we're just going to make sure that the merch doesn't really sell um, I'm always amazed like my toddler has a lot of these Marvel kind of toddler books and things like that. And you'll flip through and you're like, they'll have, you know, he has ones like the alphabet or whatever. And if Marvel characters and you flip through, it's like the F doesn't have Fantastic Four. It's another random character. And the <laughs> X isn't for X-Men and the W is not for Wolverine. And you're like, even at the little kid level, you can see that there was this incentive of like, no, we're going to push the characters that we own in the MCU uh, wow. at the expense of, of some of these characters. And they canceled the Fantastic Four book for the first time ever. I think that was gone for a couple years um, initially. And that seemed to be tied up with the Fox stuff. I think you also saw them start to push characters and, and push a bunch of books that just were never going to work. Because, like, I know for a couple of years in Marvel, they did this big push for the Inhumans. And I was like, guys, the Inhumans is a guest star in a Fantastic Four book. There's some great characters. They're not going to sustain their own line of books, and those would all fail. But then they and, made and a TV the show. Sales. They made a yeah, TV no, show. No, the TV never... show, and then the TV show didn't work. You just started seeing, I think, them get a little bit greedy. With that, I think the other thing that happened and it was interesting to me when it occurred in the comic books, and I I know they will only say it wasn't intentional, but as the Avengers movies got big, I want to say it was like 2014. For some reason, I guess every creative at Marvel had the inkling that, you know what, Steve Rogers shouldn't be Captain America anymore, and Tony shouldn't be Iron Man, and Jane shouldn't be Thor, and Hulk shouldn't be Bruce Banner anymore, and Wolverine should die and then lo and behold, a couple years later, when all of the actors in those popular roles got too expensive, all the replacement characters in the comic books were conveniently there. And that's the crazy thing that happened is like it was all in the same timeline of like a year where Steve was gone, Tony was gone, Thor was gone, and it hey. was Jane Foster and Sam Wilson and um, my, you know sure my thing Riri is- Williams. You're not writing them in continuity with each other anyway. So why do that? It kind of seemed like what happened is they were like, you know what? Forget the comic book fans. 
Let's just get a six issue arc that has Sam Wilson as Captain America. And then when Chris Evans gets too expensive, we can go, well, guys, it's comic book accurate. Falcon, Falcon's been Captain America before, even though no one bought that comic book and it got canceled like three times. And I feel like so that's what started happening is oh. Marvel started putting together a bunch of arcs that seemed like, man, this only seems aimed at like when Chris Evans and Robert Downey Jr. get too expensive or don't want to do the role anymore, we can go. When we went to the comic books and that's where these guys are, you know, Jane has always been Thor in the comics or something like that. It kind of felt like all of a sudden they started integrating all of these plots just to get them done. And then lo and behold, we're at this point in the Marvel Cinematic Universe now where all those storylines that didn't work in the comics have integrated into the films and it hasn't worked there either. I, I just feel like overall the movies, it seemed it just seemed a net negative on everything because I think the creative talent dried up because they were like, man, forget this. Why am I going to write for these guys who will just give me a line at the end of the credits instead of giving me any props to the story? I mean, I mean, and you look at it, I mean, if you're Jim Starlin and you see Thanos who you created, like become this massive character and like, what? wait, he saw nothing out of that. Like that's his creation. And like, well, he's like line 753 in the credits where everybody's not paying attention. Welcome just to waiting. the Jack Kirby club. Yeah. And it's, yeah. I mean, what we saw this happen was Sieg Siegel and Schuster had that heartbreaking story with, with, with Superman and the movie and how they didn't get anything and Kirby and all these guys. I just think overall the movies, it diluted the product. We didn't get a tie in. And I think it disincentivized creatives. And and then you throw in the fact that they started writing the comics where it seemed like the goal was, what's a cheap, quick way that we can get something on the page, say that it's canon, and then when we do it in the movies, fans can't complain because it's, hey, it's canon, guys. It happened in the comics. Um, it's sad because this, this should have been a golden age of comic book tie-in the movies, it the way the manga and anime. Slam. It should have been a boom like you know the early 90s it should have exploded and it just fizzled and it's really sad i will say on a positive note um what the movies had done for the fandom in general is really push it to a mass audience uh, i am now free to tell the guys in the office that i am a comic book nerd and i get some modicum of respect that I never, go for. <laughs> they'll come to me with like, well, well wait, um, you know, uh, did Thor get replaced by Jane Foster? And I can kind of fill them in on all of that. Um, but, you know, uh, it boosted the fandom to, you know, huge heights um, where it was just, you know, for decades as a comic book fan, like I was, we were kind of like scrambling around in dusty old bookstores <laughs> back rooms and you know <laughs> I, I will to say get our comics and, and and enjoy it and we were always like you know isolated like uh, I didn't know too many people uh, as an adult that still like comics like I did I didn't know anybody the only thing that I will say that I think is kind of weird on that um I remember being in high school and I absolutely I was I was on multiple so I don't look at it anymore but I was on multiple sports teams and um you know things like that. I was pretty, I was decently popular in school. I remember like when I had a girlfriend, like I was not bringing up comic books at all. Like it was yeah. a dumb man that gets, that gets put yeah. away. And I pretend I don't even know what Spider-Man is in, in, in that area. Right. I think what's happened is I, I actually, I actually kind of preferred how it used to be though. And I'll, I'll say this, why, why I think now what's happened is the people who used to hate this stuff, who used to mock fans like you and me and like people who read comic books, they kind of seem like they're in charge now. And they basically get to kind of look and try to boss real fans out of the medium. It seems like in that, I think what we've seen is we'll, we'll kind of have people now where, and I hate because everything turns into a, a cultural kind of war now, but it's interesting in that like, you know, Fantastic Four, right? Now I'll just bring. They're not using Norrin Rad in the upcoming Silver Surfer movie. They are using Shala Ball instead. So we are not getting the actual Silver Surfer. We're getting a one-off character who appeared in one issue instead. 
And you'll get people now who are comic book fans who will go, man, that's wrong. That shouldn't happen. Like Silver Surfer is Norm Rad. And you'll get these yeah. people who have nothing to do with comic books going, no, you're just complaining because it's a woman is Silver Surfer instead of Norm Rad. It's mm-hmm. like, no, as a comic book fan, look, Norm Rad may not mean anything to you as, right. a, as a fan of these com- of these movies. But for me, as a Silver Surfer fan who's been reading that comic since the early 90s, like when I started picking up comics, the character who's been around since the 60s was created by Kirby. To have that character, we're going to get a Silver Surfer on screen, and you're just going, not Norrin Rad. For me to say, hey, I think that's wrong. Instead, now it's like, instead of the comic book fans who are mad about that, it's more like you get these people who don't even care about Norrin Rad going, no, you're just, you're just mad because it's a, it's not, it's a girl. And it's like, no, you're, you're ignoring this huge history. And I feel like that's an isolated example. But I think what we've seen is we've seen a lot of these people who made fun of comic book fans who didn't like comics, who didn't respect the medium. They're now kind of in charge of the medium. And they now try to tell comic book fans like, and your medium was always kind of broken. We're going to improve it. We're going to make it better. And anytime a comic book fan kind of complains, and again, I want to make sure I'm very clear. When a comic book fan complains about something, it should be something where you're like, hey, man, Superman shouldn't have blonde hair because he has black hair in the comics. Like, that's a legit yeah. complaint, right? right? That's something that violates actual comic canon, and not some of these ridiculous things that we see where people get overly upset and for, for dumb reasons. But I think what we've seen is we have seen, because of the prevalence of movies, people who didn't really like this stuff, didn't really like the fans of it, come in and start pushing out fans and acting like, hey, your complaints don't really matter. And it's like something like that Silver Surfer thing for me is like a comic book fan. That's a big deal. And for them, it's kind of like, eh, just shut up and get over it. And I think that I do think that's another negative that's happened is that there's I, these used I, to be these unifying things. And now it's, again, another thing that people get divided over. Well, it's the age old, uh, you know, executive decisions that get made way high up in the you know, the movie industry, uh, they get, they hire script writers, uh, they might hire a comic book fan, they may not, they just, whatever writer uh, they feel can do it. And then they give them a few comic books and they say, write a script and, you know, they, they don't have a feel for the character. And oh, hey, wouldn't it be great to have a long haired surfer babe in Chrome on a surfboard? Wouldn't that look cool? Uh, yeah, it would look cool. But you know, for the, the depth, surfer, yeah, yeah, the depth of the plot and the story, you know, you need the original sur- Silver Surfer there because he has a lot of history and can bring a lot of gravitas to the role. But hey, it's a comic book movie, and how much gravitas do you want? We just want to sell popcorn and and movie tickets, and, you know. And it's like, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, um, in, in comic book fans, yeah, we we do have a tendency to get too upset over small changes. And things like that. I, I do think that's a case too. But I, I just, it's interesting in that I never would have thought when the comic book movie started that it would be a negative for comic books. But I would say, as a comic book fan, I if I look at the last surprised. 20 years, yeah. if I look at the last 20 years, there's no question, in my opinion, for the big two at the very least, comic books are worse. The, the comic books, the, the quality is worse. The the amount of books that we get, the character arcs are worse. And I never would have thought that. I would have thought that this would have been this huge boom that would have gotten us so yeah. many people excited about it. And I instead, think, I mean, sales are lower and I'd say quality is down too. And that's crazy. I think that um, they work separately, you know, both the movie division and the, and the publishing division. They just were entrenched in separate camps and had they worked together, it could have been, you know, there could have been money for both. Um, but the movie industry doesn't care what the publishing industry does. And the publishing industry, um, you know, whatever they had to do in the backroom deal to get that comic book at the movie theater, I don't care, you know, if I was in the marketing team, I'd find a way, you know, million late night calls or whatever and i'd I'd make it happen and and put my best creative team on it and let's write a good story and have it tie in to what comes out next month and and bring them in to the store with a coupon and just get them uh interested again in coming into a comic book store and finding something that they can relate to because a they just saw it on the screen uh, B, they don't have an intense uh, knowledge of the history 
or the continuity, but if you have something that ties in with the screen, it, it could work and you could have pushed everything up, um, but instead they stayed in their separate camps and we are where we are with sales declining and you know quality it's just sad because especially like the template was right there with manga i mean i'm always amazed at how often my son will see an episode of an anime and then like want to go to the store and pick up volumes of the manga and stuff like that and i think that's not like you said all the time with my teenager all the time yeah like you said it's amazing that the publishing wings of these comic books and the movies didn't ever get an alignment in that You'd have thought at some point they'd have looked and went, man, it'd be really smart if we did, you know, hey, everybody really loved Thanos from this movie. Why don't we do a story that has, you know, him in the comic books where people could pick up material that that relates to it? Instead, you know, even a character like Thanos who worked on screen, you go read his comic book counterpart. They're not the same character. Like no. the, other than the gauntlet and stuff like that. And, and that's that's the craziest thing is you would think, man, we're going to give these characters this huge multimedia push. And then you go pick up the comic and it's like, man, anybody who went and saw Infinity War and Endgame and then went and picked up that storyline in the comics of the Infinity Stones and all that. Like, yeah, good luck, man. Like nothing is accurate from You're that at all, really, other than Thanos has a gauntlet with the gems. And that's yeah. about it. You are lost. Yep. But uh, I don't know. It's sad. I wouldn't have thought it would be. But yeah, I would say overall, I think either a net zero or net negative, which is just shocking when you look at it. Let us know what you guys think below. Do you think the comic book movies negatively impacted the comic book industry? We know most folks who are watching us are probably more comic book fans than comic book movie fans. Probably a heavy crossover there. But if you're a comic book fan, a Wednesday warrior, someone who picks up your books, uh, do you think the movies actually negatively impacted uh, the the comics as we do? Um, As always, folks, let us know what you think down below. Thank you, as always, for watching. God bless you. You have a great week. Thanks, everybody.